Right. Hello. Um, so first of all, has the section stuff all been sorted on now? Okay, good one note. Okay. All right, good. Um, so I'm just going to start talking about what I was talking about last time, um, and then I got stuck on at the end last time, which is. So how can I write the laid down or laid aside or transferred according to Hobbes? So he says it's by giving words or other voluntary signs. When I was trying to figure out is why do the signs have to be voluntary? So I think um, this is the answer. So somehow by producing the, the production of these signs has to create an impediment to me doing something that before there was no impediment to me of doing or forbearing. But anyway, before there was no impediment to doing or forbearing a certain action to me, right? So that, that's what Hobbes means by saying I have a right. To do it. Um, so by producing these, the production of these signs somehow has to create an impediment. Now, of course, it doesn't create a literal impediment, right? Like it doesn't build a wall which keeps me from going somewhere or something. But it has to be one of those artificial chains impediments. By the way, I keep calling it artificial chains because that's what Hobbes is going to call it. But uh, we haven't got to the part where we use that phrase yet. But <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm anticipating. But anyway, one of these artificial chains. Um, Frank. This makes an air. I'm sorry, we have another incident. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. on there. Oh. You're talking about the laying down of rights. Yes. Right. So laying down of rights means, I mean, as I said last time, of course, a right is not something you can literally lay down. I mean, I can lay down, I can lay my book down on the ground, but I, it's still my book. <laughs> right. How do I lay down my right to the book? So it's some kind of metaphor, um, and, but I'm trying to figure out what the metaphor, how, how it literally works. And Hobbes says it literally works by giving words or other voluntary signs. And those things have to result in my right being laid down, meaning that I no, I no longer have it. I can either, yeah. Could it, could it perhaps uh, relate to like the phrase laying down of arms? Um, does that have to do with laying down chaos and void of uh, war? And this type of thing. I think I think the literal case that he's thinking about is just what I was saying before. That just like you know, like in the case of actually possessing something, like having it in your literal grasp. The way you end that is to put it down or to give it to someone else, right? So that you can lay down rights or you can transfer rights. When you when you transfer rights, you say who is going to have the right now instead of you. When you lay down rights, you just um, you just act out of it. So uh, um, Right, and not having a right anymore means, like having a right means, it's a little confusing because having a, having a right is actually something negative, right? Like having a right means there's no impediment. So if I have a right to do X, that means there's nothing stopping me from doing X or not doing X. Nothing external, by the way, that actually has to be, uh, I haven't always been adding that in, but that's important, right? Because if there's something within me that's stopping me from
from doing X. Hobbes says, in that case, we say that what's lacking is not a right, but a power. So there's no external, if I, have, if I have a right to do X, that means there's no external impediment to me doing X. And so somehow something is going to, whatever it is that accomplishes the laying down of the rights, it creates a new impediment that wasn't there before. And what I was just saying is, of course, it doesn't literally create an impediment. What it creates is um, uh, a kind of bad consequence of that from now on, I'm going to have to reckon. So like before, if I had done X, there wouldn't have been these bad consequences. But now, because of what I did in laying down the right, there will be bad consequences. I do X, and that means I no longer have a right to do X. Um, so the reason it has to be voluntary is that this artificial impediment works only by me, like, uh, um, acknowledging it and you know, showing that I now am take I'm taking these bad consequences that there are going to be into account. So I can't just kind of like inadvertently make this happen. Um, so somehow by like by um willing to emit these words or other voluntary signs, um, I have shown that that there, there now will be bad consequences if I do X and I know. So the question is, and they, of course, they have to be reliable bad consequences. Again, Hobbes doesn't usually add that, but I think it's, you know, in, in a state of nature, Basically, whatever you do is probably going to have bad consequences. <laughs> it's a state of war all against all. But the problem is you can't be sure, like, you know, uh, who will end up paying the price in the end, you or the other person, right? So there's no, like, reliability. So, so the question is, though, how can, like, how, how can my will to emit these words or whatever, um, uh, how can I, how can I know that in doing that, I'm bringing on myself these bad consequences if I do that? So the answer normally is um, that uh, I live in a society where there's an established rule that whoever gives these signs that they're laying down the right to do X, if they afterwards do X, someone stronger than them, and who is reliably stronger than an individual, not another individual, but a whole society, right? So that if, if after I, so, so we, you know, we have a rule that if after I emit these signs, I then try to nevertheless exert the right, um, the community is gonna punish me. So that's why Hobbes says that, that normally there can't be covenants uh, in a state of nature. Because in a state of nature, I could say, you know, oh, I hereby give up the right to this acorn. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that no one can stop me from taking the acorn without fighting. So I haven't actually given up a right. Um, so, um, Hobbes does also mention another way, and there's often these little exceptions in Hobbes, not so much in Locke, there's definitely some important things like this in Rousseau, too, um, but there's like little exceptions that then maybe are important because well, let me tell you what the exception is first. So, um, 
the force of words, this, so sorry, this is chapter 14, paragraph 31 on page 87. The force of words being, as I have formerly noted, too weak to hold men to the performance of their covenant. I mean, it's really no force at all, right? Just saying, <laughs> you know, I give up my right to do X. Yeah, there's no way that can force me not to do X. So anyway, at least that's what it seems like, although maybe I'm missing something. Why does it take two weeks? Um, anyway, the force of words being, as I have formerly noted, too weak to hold men to the performance of their covenant. There are in man's nature, but two imaginable helps to strengthen it. And those are either a fear of the consequence of breaking their word. Now, the truth is, the way he puts this is misleading, because in both cases, it's going to be fear of a consequence of breaking your word. It's just the consequence is different. But anyway, so this is what he says. And those are either a fear of the consequence of breaking their word or a glory or pride in appearing not to need to break it. So that's really also a fear of consequences, right? Like if you take glory in the fact that you don't appear to need to break your word, um, then uh, the reason you won't break your word is because the consequence of that is that you will appear to need to break your word and you, you don't want that, right? So it still really is a fear of consequence, but it's a very different kind of consequence. Uh, in particular, it's a consequence that you could imagine you might fear in a state of nature. It only depends on you. Really. It depends exactly how you imagine the state of nature. But anyway, so then he goes on. This latter is a generosity. I think generosity, there's an asterisk here to look at the um, glossary, but I think generosity here means like nobility. Anyway, this latter is a generosity too rarely found to be presumed on especially in the pursuers of wealth, command, or sensual pleasure, which are the greatest part of mankind. Actually, I'm leaving out a case. The passion to be reckoned upon is fear, whereof there be two very general objects. One, the power of spirits invisible. The other, the power of those men they shall therein offend. Right, so there is actually a way of forming a covenant in the state of nature. It's just not very reliable. The way is, he says, that if we each swear by the invisible powers that we believe in, and I guess he's thinking of a particular biblical story when he says this, right, um, of uh, Jacob and Laban swearing to each other. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, if we each swear by the invisible power we believe in, then uh, However strong that belief is, that you know, and however much you believe the invisible power will actually do what we say, <laughs> um, you could rely on the covenant that much. I think Hobbes thinks it's clear that uh, um, <laughs> well, as he says, of these two, though the former be the greater power, yet the fear of the latter is commonly the greater fear. Right? In theory, these invisible spirits are super powerful and they can punish you whenever they want to. But really, people don't exactly believe that's going to happen. They're really more afraid of other people. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so. Um, uh, but the exception is. The exception is something that is rare, especially in the pursuers of wealth, command, or sensual pleasure, which are the greater part of mankind. So what are the other part of, the, of mankind's problems? The lesser parts. So, I mean, we know there's one thing that Hobbes uh, thinks that is a rare desire, which is the desire for science. So this this exam this exception may be somehow tied to the other exception, but I'm not sure. But anyway, that's that's all I have to say about it for now. So anyway, that exception aside, and also the the unreliable alternative of, of like mutually exchanging religious fears, right? 
aside, the only way covenants normally um, are going to be kept is if they're going to be enforceable by the whole community. So in that situation, you can understand why if I show by words or other signs that I'm taking on the threat of that punishment, then you can rely on the uh, uh, not doing what before I had a right to do. Yeah. So how does that apply to America right now? Because look at foreign you automatically are expected to abide by the Constitution, abide by law, common law, interest about everything. But there's no word or voluntary sign that you give that they would be Yeah. So um I mean, there's no word, but there are voluntary signs. So remember, like what I said, I think, although for Locke, that's going to be a problem. But I think for Hobbes, it's not a big problem because, uh, you know, um, it's easy to give signs of the fact that you know that you have no chance of standing up against everyone else against you when you're born. <laughs> right. Like you give signs of that constantly because everyone knows that. <laughs> right. So I mean in, in any case, that so that's also that's a question about the covenant that forms the commonwealth, which anyway is going to be possibly a weird exception to how this works, right? Because you when the when you form that covenant, there isn't a commonwealth yet. So but but if you think about like ordinary uh transactions. You know where uh, um, you know, like I so I go into a restaurant and sit down and order food. So I'm giving voluntary signs, although there's no word, but I'm giving voluntary signs of the fact that after I finish the food, I'm going to pay them. So that's a covenant. And why do those signs work? Like, uh, because if it was state of nature, there was a table and I went and sat down to it and you put acorns on them and I ate them, then it would be up to me whether to give you something or not, <laughs> right? But in the, uh, in the already created commonwealth, there's like, um, there's a law, you know, maybe not an explicit law to exactly, on that, exactly that point, although, well, I know there probably is, right? But, but you, you know, but if not, it's part of common law or whatever, right? There's a known rule that you sit down in a restaurant and order food and eat, um, and then don't pay. There's going to be bad consequences. Um, so we can reckon on you not doing. It. It's not, of course, it's never a hundred percent. So there are crimes and there are civil wars and commonwealths come to an end, right? So these things are not going to be 100% reliable, but they're reliable enough <laughs> that you can have a restaurant, right? Whereas in the state of nature, restaurants are one of the things that you, you know, civilized things that you can't have. <laughs> right. So, um, okay. So um, I just want to say one more thing about this. This is really about the reading for last time, but I just want to say one more thing about it before I go on to what it says in the new reading, which is um, that if so, if you understand how this is supposed to work, you can also understand its limitations according to Hobbes. So the limitation is, um, this is chapter 14, paragraph 8 on page 82. Um, there be some rights which no man can be understood by any words or other signs to have abandoned or transferred. Right? So this is what's called inalienable rights. Inalienable means you can't lay them down or transfer. So, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't lose them. 
It's like, if, for example, if someone builds a literal impediment, um, that you can lose rights without alienating them. But anyway, it does mean you can't give them away or transfer them. So um, there be some rights which no man can be understood by any words or other signs to have abandoned or transferred. As first, a man cannot lay down the right of resisting them that assault him by force to take away his life because he cannot be understood to aim thereby at any good to himself. Right? So, I mean, the way this transfer of work rights works is that I, um, this is good. the way this transfer of rights works is that, um, you know, I create this reliable expectation that if I do this, there's going to be bad consequences. Um, and therefore, in the future, I will prefer not doing this because I don't want those consequences. But if this is resisting those who come to assault me by force to take away my life, then Hobbes is saying, well, no matter how bad the consequences are, they're not going to cause you to prefer letting people kill you. Right, so actually he explains this um, later on in chapter 14, paragraph 29. For man by nature chooses the, less, the lesser evil, which is danger of death and resistance, rather than the greater, which is certain and present death and not resistance. Right, so like, uh, I, I can say, yeah, punish me if I, you know, if you come to take away my life and uh, I resist you, you, you can punish me. But now I have to ask, so like maybe if I fight back, I'll get away without being punished. Whereas if I don't fight back, I'm certainly going to be killed. So of course I'm going to fight back. And since of course I'm going to be going to fight back, I didn't succeed in creating an artificial chain. Whatever I said, or you know, there can't be such an instance, according to Hobbes. So, I mean, is it so? One of the things is like Hobbes always assumes that the worst thing that could happen to you is that you die, which may seem kind of common sense, except you realize that like everyone dies. <laughs> so, it's uh, it's not actually that maybe as obvious as you think. So. But um, anyway, if, if you accept that assumption, then you can understand why he says, the, like, nothing I do can give away the right. So what that means is it's, it's, it's going to create a weird kind of paradox. It's going to mean that, that like, a criminal who, is, um, who violates a law that's made by a common law and is going to be put to death has every right to resist. Because that's not a right you can give away. Um, so, um, you know, and then he also lists there some other rights. Basically, well, it's not life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but it's life uh, not being wounded and liberty, <laughs> right? So, like, if you know, if they attack you and they say, "Oh no, we're not trying to kill you; we're just trying to wound you," <laughs> Hobbes says, "Well, you can't really be sure where they're going to stop." So you you know, and similarly, if they say, "Don't worry, we're not going to kill you; we're just going to chain you up," Hobbes says, "Well, you know, once they chain you up, they can do whatever they want." Right? So it's the same, you know, right? So those are the things that that uh, those are rights you can't give away. So the, so the covenant that creates the Commonwealth is going to have to work around this. Um, it's going to have to ensure that people um, mostly obey the law because of rights that they have given up that are that are less than the right of you know, defending yourself when the executioner actually comes. Yes. Are those rights off the same only as rights uh, are able to be created? Yes. 
Right, that's the right you can't give away. And you literally can't give it away. Okay. Right, because nothing you could do would count as giving it away. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about in discussion about suicide. Like, yeah. So, like, I don't know, like, we're not allowed to give up our lives or whatever, like, if we, if we decide to or whatever, because it, the state has, like, we, we, if we give up our, that's part of laying our right down, like, we can't uh, take our own lives or whatever. Well, I, you know, I mean, so obviously that's a crime that, you know, can't be punished after the crime. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, um, but yeah, I don't, does Hobbes say anything anywhere against, about laws against suicide? I, I mean, So you could like you could imagine it being enforced in the following way: whoever commits suicide, their heirs won't get their property, something like that. So they can't be buried in the common cemetery. People care about that, right? Or you know stuff like that. Um, um, so because even though he 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 always talks, he always seems to assume that dying is the worst thing that can happen to you. That doesn't mean you don't care at all about things that happen after you die. You do care about that, he says, because the present imagination of, of a future event that pleases you is, is already pleasing. So like if you imagine your descendants being well off, that's nice. And like if you're not able to imagine that anymore because someone has created a different expectation, then that would be bad. So um, yeah, so I guess, you know, that's how you could imagine something like that being enforced. Um, but I don't remember if he talked about that. I mean, as far as like, I think because he thinks that dying is the worst thing that could happen to you, he thinks there's a law of nature against killing yourself. But it's, I mean, uh, I mean, in a sense, that's what all the laws of nature are. They're all laws against killing yourself, right? Or, or making yourself miserable. So like, if you're rational, he thinks you won't kill yourself. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, and remember, that's all the laws of nature are really tell us. You know, they say, well, if yeah, you want what's good for you, do it. So if you don't, <laughs> All right, that, that's all I can say about that off the top of my head. All right, so let me go on to the new reading, which is it's just continuous with this, but it's like it's going on to this special covenant. Like if covenants are going to be kept, um, which is needed for mutual laying down of rights, which is needed for seeking peace, there's going to have to be this one special covenant. Um, and how can that be done? So again, it can't be done if by me unilaterally starting to obey the laws of nature. Process. That would just make, like let everyone else take advantage of it. So how can it be done? And Hobbes says there's only one way. This is chapter 17, paragraph 13, page 109. Um, to confer, this is how people are going to do it, to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men. I should check in the Latin here to see. I bet it doesn't say beer. I bet it says homo, right? Like, it, it, there's nothing in this context that would make you think that it has to be men. But it's, of course, it still has that. 
and it doesn't mean it's harmless that he says math. That's the point I was trying to make before. It's always it's always been a double-edged word. Okay, but anyway, so to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voices unto one will, which is as much as to say, to appoint, oh, sorry, I read that wrong. To confer all their power and strength upon one man, that's one option, or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voices unto one will, which is much as much as to say, oh, no, still doing that. Okay. To confer all their power and strength upon one man, or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voices unto one will. So those are the two options, right? They can confer all their power on one individual, or they can confer all their power on an assembly of individuals who are going to reach a decision by majority vote. Right? And, um, uh, you know, how do you know it has to be majority vote? We have, we have some discussion of that, but basically the, you know, if it's not majority vote, it would have to be unanimity, which is not primary. Um, so, uh, so, um, so, so given that procedure of deciding majority vote, that one assembly has one will, just like one individual has one will. That is like only one desire or aversion is going to be translated into action at, at the end, the one that the majority approves. So, to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men, which is as much as to say, to appoint one man or assembly of men to bear their person. And everyone to own and acknowledge himself to be author of whatsoever he that so bear their person shall act. Shall act or cause to be acted in those things which concern the common peace and safety. And therein to submit their wills, everyone to his will, and their judgments to his judgment. So the initial uh, covenant that forms the commonwealth is a co we, what we all agree to. There's actually two steps, but. Um, No. We agree to let one individual bear our person. This step is unanimous. Then we choose the individual. This step is by majority vote. So in this initial discussion of it, he doesn't break it down into these two steps, but elsewhere he does. And I'm emphasizing this because we'll see these same two steps turning up in Locke and Rousseau and Wollstonecraft. You know, so, so for reasons we'll we'll see when we get to her, she doesn't talk about the Initial formation of society as much as the others. I mean, there's a, there's like a systematic reason she does, it. but um, so uh, but yeah. So there's these two steps. The first step is that we all agree that one individual is going to bear our person. That is. So I'm going to say something about what a person bearing person means in a second, right? But what we it means we each individually agree. We agree that one individual is going to be selected, and that that individual is going to bear my person, your person, everyone's person. But we haven't chosen that individual yet. 
So in the description I just read, he, he blends these two steps together, right? Because of course we're not done until we choose one. Number one, I mean, actually you could say there's two choices to make here. We have to choose the form of government. Is it gonna be a single human being, this individual, or is it gonna be an assembly? And if it's gonna be an assembly, is it gonna be an assembly of some or an assembly of all? So we have to decide that, but then this, unless we choose assembly of all, we furthermore have to choose who is gonna be that one human being or that assembly. Um, so those later choices, Hobbes says, once we've all agreed to this, we've actually already set up the covenant. And those later choices we make um, as a body um, by majority rule. But then, like, that's the last time we do anything by majority rule unless we set up a democracy, right? Because, or, I mean, you could say we do something by majority rule, we do things by majority rule, but the problem is that the person, the individual we've chosen to bear our person now has the right to vote on everyone's behalf. <laughs> so they don't need to go ask people how they vote, they just decide. <laughs> so there is, so, so this is the last time according to Hobbes, again, unless what we form is a democracy, where democracy means not what we call democracy, right? Democracy means that, that the supreme authority is the assembly of everyone. Um, at least everyone who's gonna count as a citizen of this commonwealth, right? That causes tricky problems. You know, like in Athens, Athens was kind of a democracy in this sense, except that um, there were a lot of women, slaves, foreigners, whatever, who were not citizens and were not in the same country. Um, but okay, anyway, um, so, so that's how it's supposed to work. And then the question is, so what does it mean that we chose someone to bear our person? So, per, so this is the official definition of person. This is chapter 16, paragraph one on page 101. A person is he whose words or actions are considered either as his own or as representing the words or actions of another man or of any other thing to whom they are attributed, whether truly or by fiction. So that is, Hobbes says that person means basically actor or agent. And actor and agent are basically the same word, right? They're just like, um, they're both forms of the same Latin verb together, right? So like, they, you know, they both mean someone who acts. Um, and Hobbes uses the word actor for both of these. So like in cases where we would say actor, like someone on the stage, Hobbes says actor. But in cases where we would say agent, Hobbes also says actor. <laughs> so, um, so person means all of this, and it's all supposed to be covered by that definition, both the cases we would call actor and the cases we would call agent. It's supposed to be covered by that one definition. Um, and the, the definition is that someone's words or actions, so first of all, either are considered as his own. So that's like the case where we call someone a free agent, right? Like an agent means, just means someone who acts on their own behalf. Right, so, so according to Hobbes, everyone bears their own person. Right, meaning everyone's words and actions represent themselves. That's what he calls a natural person, right? But on the other hand, it could be someone whose words and actions represent another. 
So there's different ways that can happen. So one is actually someone pretending to be me on a stage. That's so right. So so that's a person. And Hobbes says that the word person, and I guess this is true, a lot of his etymologies are, are not reliable. But I think in this case it's pretty it's true that persona like meant a mask. Right. So he says that's the origin of, of all the later uses of person. We're, you know, we're, we're talking about the way someone can represent me on stage by putting on a mask that looks like me. Um, so, uh, but also the cases where like I say, um, uh, here's some money, go buy some potatoes for me. I'm making my agent to buy potatoes. So um, in that case also, when you go to the store and you give them my money and take the potatoes, you're representing my will, right? Like you're there to do what I would do if I were there. Um, um, and that last case is the important case for our purposes because in that case the agent is authorized and the person who makes the agent is called the author so um, right so that is that's the case where the person is authorized to bear my person for the, for in, we use person to mean like human being now. Right? So <laughs> it's a little hard to talk about this, but it's the case where the, 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 this other individual is authorized to bear my person. We might say they're my authorized agent. <laughs> um, So, um, so this is a little bit different from the way we talk about like legal persons or legal personality. They, like if there's a corporation and basically a commonwealth is a kind of corporation. They, um, I mean, it's not a joint stock corporation, I know, but it's a kind of corporation, right? So um, if there's a corporation, um, that's like recognized by the law as capable of, um, well, for example, as capable of violating the law and deserving to be punished. Then we say that this corporation is a legal person, a legal personhood or whatever. But in Hobbes terminology, the person is actually like the board of directors maybe. The board of directors is the assembly of human beings who um, are authorized to act on behalf of the corporation to bear its person. And Hobbes says, you know, with, with it's possible uh, within a commonwealth to be an authorized agent of all kinds of things, like a bridge or um, a, a church or um, a, um, you know, someone who's in custodianship or whatever, right? Like, but um, but uh, that's that's due to the laws the Commonwealth has made. But like the normal way of being an authorized agent is that the person you're representing, that is the author, says, "I hereby make you my agent." Um. So being an author constitutes giving up a certain right. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about um, authorship and or agency in the, in the, in the terms of like uh, a custodianship or like uh, being being the agent of a bridge or a church, but uses a different word in the text. Uses like the word personated. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, because I'm using our terminology of agents and whatever, right? But he's, I mean, this this is, I'm, I'm using this to explain his word person. Yeah. So to bear the person or to personate or to personate with authority is to be an authorized agent. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the metaphor is there. I mean, I think you can understand it without understanding the part, right? To be on someone's person means to be their agent or to, well, to be their agent or to pretend to be them or to pretend to be their agent, right? If they're not authorized. That's also to bear their person, but in an unauthorized way, to personate them, or as we would say, impersonate them, right? Um, but what the bear part is, I mean, I mean, you can kind of think of it this way. So I stay here, and you go to the store and buy my potatoes, and you kind of like carry my will to the store with you, <laughs> so that you're bearing my person to the store. Yeah, I think that's the metaphor. But of course, it doesn't really work that way, right? I don't really give you some magic thing to carry. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, right. So, what I was starting to say is that um, to be an author is to give up a certain right. Um, because I'm agreeing at least under certain conditions or in certain contexts to accept the end of the agents or per the personators, person's <laughs> deliberation as my own. Right, so like, you know, the, I'm making my agent to go buy potatoes, like, you know, um, um, you decide which potatoes to get. Um, you decide means, according to Hobbes, you deliberate, right? You go, in this case, probably really quickly, but you go through desire or aversion. Oh, this potato looks good. No, this one's better, right? Um, you're, the final desire or aversion is your will. And that's what gets translated into action. So, um, you know, furthermore, like, let's say you have to bargain for the potatoes, right? Maybe that's a, a better example. You know, you, that means you're going to have to decide when it's time to, to settle. So, um, so by, by authorizing you, I'm giving up my right to will the opposite. Right, so I may still desire the opposite. Like I might say, boy, I wish you got a better price than you could pay. <laughs> but assuming I've given you the sufficient authority when I made you my agent, uh, I can desire it. And so like that desire will be the final stage of my deliberation, but I'm not allowed to translate it into action. Rather, the final stage of your deliberation is the one that will get translated. I said that in a pretty abstract way. Like, do people understand? I mean, because especially it's a little confusing because you might think being an author means like now you're powerful, you have someone working for you. <laughs> but, it, but according to Hobbes, it's the opposite. You're giving up on something. You're giving up on the right to second guess. You're saying whatever they do on your behalf is going to count as your action, and you can't consent. Um, So I guess in this corporation I was drawing before, where this is the board of directors, like the board, the if in in what we usually call a corporation, like a 
for profit joint stock corporation or whatever, right? Like the the individual members of this body are the shareholders. And the board of directors is bearing their first. Um, so, uh, um, and Hobbes says, uh, I won't read this from inside, but this it's in chapter 16 and paragraph 13 through 14, that when a multitude are personated with authority, each individual member of the multitude individually authorizes the agent, the person. Um, it has to be that way, he says. Why? Because suppose these people wanted to not each individually authorize the agent, but all together do. So then there would need to be someone to speak for all of them. And that person who was able to, or that individual who was able to speak for all of them would be bearing their person, would be their agent. So they would already have done it. So before they've done it, they're just a bunch of individuals. So they can only do it by each one of them agreeing to authorize the same individual or you know, human being or assembly of human beings. They have to coordinate with each other. Right? They have to somehow agree that, they, that right? because if each one of these people appointed a different board of directors to represent them, there would be no corporation. So they have to somehow um, agree that it's going to be the same one. And that's what this agreement is. The agreement that forms the Commonwealth. It's going to be uh, um, it has to be started by a consensus where everyone who's going to be a member of it individually authorizes um, one individual or assembly. Uh, or, like I said, actually, it works in two steps. They agree that they're all going to choose the same one. Once they agree that they're all, and there's something weird about this. I think the full weirdness of it, but also the explanation of it is going to come out more in Rousseau. It's like once they've made this agreement, now they choose by majority. So what that kind of means is that they temporarily made the assembly of everyone bear their person. Right? Like that's what this initial stage was just long enough to choose, right? So they say like, okay, we're all gonna get together and form a commonwealth. And we need to decide, is it gonna be a monarchy? And if so, who's gonna be the monarch? Um, so like as a means to that, they temporarily make the assembly of everyone, um, give it the power to decide who's gonna be if it's going to be a monarchy, and if so, who's going to be a monarchy? And then it can be decided by majority vote. And I think, you know, I mean, you might say, well, why not just do it all in one step the way Hobbes makes it, first makes it sound like it's going to work. But I think Hobbes thinks that you're never going to get a very big commonwealth that way. Because it's not possible that everyone is going to agree. Right? Like, there's going to be someone who says, no, I want my friend to be one. So they have, so they have to go through this two-step process. I think that's why Hobbes thinks they have to go through this two-step process. We'll see that Rousseau has like a stronger reason why they have to do it that way. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting there. So, all right. Um, So now notice it's important. I'm drawing lines this way, but these lines are not the covenant. 
These lines don't represent the covenant. These lines represent authority. When, when I um, when I authorize you to uh, bear my person, I don't make a covenant with you. Um, I mean, of course, I could make a covenant saying that if you agree to be bear my person, I'll pay you or something like that, right? But just the act of making of, of saying your will will represent mine is not a covenant with you. Um, it's a unilateral laying down of my rights, <laughs> right? So, so these lines are the transfer of authority, but the actual covenant is not with the agent or person who's going to be chosen. The actual covenant is between these people. Um, and as we know from, from already from the second law, it's a mutual laying down of rights. Um, but now we understand what are the rights that we're mutually laying down. So it's, you know, I mean, because like at first when you hear that to get out of the state of war, we have to mutually lay down some rights, you might think that it would start like this, like, I lay down the right to take your acorn if you'll lay down the right to take my acorn. I'll lay down the right to kill you if you lay down the right to kill me, et cetera. But that's actually not exactly how it works. The right that each person is laying down is um, the right to second guess this individual who's going to bear our person. So, um, right, so I'm laying down the will, the, the right to act contrary to the agent's will on my behalf. And you're also laying down. And we all lay down that right. And so now we've all agreed that whatever this agent or a person that I'm about to switch to a better word for this agent or person, but I'm going to call it that one, one more second. You know, what we've, um, we've now all agreed that whatever this agent or person does, we're going to recognize as our own action. Um, and so once this agent or person is chosen, they're called the sovereign. So the sovereign can be a single human being, that's a monarchy, or the sovereign can be a sovereign assembly, that's an aristocracy, or the sovereign can be the assembly of everyone. Or actually, as Hobbes says, kind of anticipating some objections, that later people are going to make about this. He says, everyone who cares to attend or something like that. Right? Like, we don't literally, to have a democracy, we don't literally have to force everyone to attend every time. People who don't show up because they're sick or because they don't feel like it or whatever, just don't, you know, they didn't vote that. Anyway, never mind that. That's complication. But so the sovereign, again, is either one human being, in that case, it's a monarchy, or it's an assembly, in that case, an aristocracy, or it's the assembly of everyone, in that case, it's a democracy. Um, and this will bring about peace. This just by itself is enough to bring about peace. Why? Well, at least assuming the sovereign acts rationally on behalf of all the people, who have made them their agent, what they will do is um, say, uh, on behalf of all of you, I uh, you know, hereby declare that whoever breaks the law of nature will be punished. 
right? I mean, in a sense, that's the only thing the sovereign can can say if they act rationally in our case. Or at least that's the fundamental thing they can say, right? Because again, that's the thing that, right? So, so now think I'm in this position, I'm the agent who's representing this multitude. So I have to act on all of their behalf. So I have to act towards some end that they all agree to. And we already heard there's only one peace. Right? So I have to act um, again if I do what I should. <laughs> That's obviously the big if, right? But if I do, if if I really um, uh, carry out my my charge as agent, then uh, what I will do is um, declare on everyone's behalf that from now on there's going to be peace. And uh, assuming that this covenant holds, which you have to ask why it does, but assuming this covenant holds, that means everyone has now given up their right to say other things. So the sovereign says there's going to be peace. So I've given up my right to say. Professor, you're muted. Oh, sorry, that just happened now? Yeah, just right now. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. Also, I don't know why I'm not spotlighted. Did that also just happen or was I not spotlighted the whole time? No, I would have noticed that. Okay, I don't know. All right. Um, Maybe it's like Zoom bombing. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, wasn't there something in the onion about? No, I don't know what it was. But some someone Zoom bombing a marketing meeting, and we end up, like, you know, getting sucked into it. And <laughs> All right, never mind. Sorry. That's <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, so, the, so in other words, the sovereign is going to declare that we should have peace on everyone's behalf and is going to now use our collective force to enforce that position. So, you know, I mean, you're probably asking yourself, isn't this kind of circular? I mean, we're trying to make covenants work by, by means of a covenant. Right? Like, you know, all these people were in the state of nature. So we understand why in a civil state, in a commonwealth, people want to form a corporation. Well, they may need authorization of the law or whatever. But in any case, if people want to form a corporation, we understand why they can make this the agreement with each other. And then they're relying on the Commonwealth to enforce the agreement. But in a state of nature, who are they relying on to enforce the agreement? Well, of course, like once the agreement is enforced, the sovereign is going to enforce it. But um, that seems like it's too late. Okay, we need we need to know what's going to enforce it before it's enforced. Right when all we had is a bunch of people sitting around in a forest and said, "I hereby give up my right to whatever." How is that going to make it magically happen? That if I say, "You know what? I changed my mind. Everyone will punish me." Um, So I think the answer is that every other covenant that so for, that is for every other covenant that's made after this in a civil state, 
the you know the what um, creates those artificial chains is the fear of punishment. And we now understand that means fear of punishment by the sovereign. Of course, it doesn't mean the sovereign, whether it's one person or, or an assembly, is actually going to show up at my door. Right. But, uh, um, but, but, I mean, you know, we talk more about the powers of the sovereign. The more detail on this, but the, but the, the sovereign can tell people what to do, either by a standing law or just by telling them directly. Why can the sovereign tell people what to do? Well, you know, they're the author. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, uh, the sovereign is telling me what to do on my own behalf. So, um, right, so that's what enforces uh, covenants normally, right? So like in chapter 15, paragraph 19 on page 85, says, um, in a civil estate where there is a power set up to constrain those that would otherwise violate their faith, that fear is, that is, Sorry, the, the fear he's talking about in this. Yeah. Um, so that no, no, I can't. Anyway, in a civil estate where there's a power set up to constrain those that would otherwise violate their faith, that fear, it's the, the fear is that the other person won't deliver. Right? So I say, um, I'm not going to deliver either. It's in the state of nature, there always is. That fear is no more reasonable. That is, is no longer reasonable. And for that cause, he by which the covenant is to perform first is obliged to do so to do. Right? So in a civil state, I'm obliged to carry out my part of the covenant um, because uh, I know that uh, the other person will be forced to carry out their part. I think that's a little bit. A little bit more complicated than I made it up. But in any case, it's certainly the fear of the sovereign that keeps it causes people to keep their covenants in a civil state. That is in a common law. But this covenant, so there must be some fear. It could be fear of invisible powers. But we don't think that's very reliable. So there must be some fear um, that is going to get people to keep their covenant, but it can't be fear of the sovereign. Because if they don't keep this covenant, there is no sovereign. So um, what is the fear? And I think, although Hobbes doesn't say this, but I don't see any other way through this. This covenant is special because Everyone knows that everyone wants peace in common. So the fear that's going to enforce it is the fear of a return to the war of all against all. So, like, you know, it's not the sovereign isn't someone really strong necessarily. Right? I mean, the, what's happening here is we're settling on the sovereign. Um, we all, in the state of nature, want to leave the state of nature. And we fear being stuck in the state of nature or being returned to the state of nature if we ever leave it because it's miserable. So, but, but we need a like, single thing to, we can all agree on. That will make that happen. Once we have that single thing that we all agree on, um, suppose I think, well, you know what, I'm an exception. I'm not going to keep this covenant. Then, if I deliberate more, I'll realize everyone else is going to be really mad at me. <laughs> but we just figured this way out of the state of nature, which is horrible. And they're going to see I'm trying to screw that up. And everyone knows that everyone else knows. 
So because they're also afraid of returning to the state of nature, they know that without any command from the sovereign, everyone else is gonna like stop them if they try to break the I think that's the way it works. And so I can foresee with certainty that the others are gonna stick to their word. They don't wanna return to the state of nature. I guess this is what I was just saying in a different way. I can foresee that everyone else is gonna to stick to their word because they don't want to return to the state of nature. Well, how far are they gonna to stick to their word? We know, of course, they won't stop, stick to their word if the sovereign says, okay, now on your behalf, I declare that you're gonna be put to death. And they can say, no, I didn't authorize that. I couldn't authorize that. But that's not necessary. What's necessary is that like, if the sovereign says, I'm gonna be put to death, everyone else has to stick to their word enough not to interfere with that. And at least some have to stick to their word enough to carry it out. So if I'm thinking, now what should I do now that we've all made this comment? I'm thinking, okay, if it comes down to um, the sovereign against me, I'm gonna be on my side, of course, um, because I didn't give up the right to defend myself or whatever. But everyone else is gonna be on the sovereign side. I foresee that reliably because I foresee them saying, oh shit, we're on the way back to the state of nature. <laughs> and therefore, when I deliberate, I say, no, it's not worth it. Um, now, I mean, there is, so like, I think that kind of, that works if you think about it, I mean, does it work? Is it 100% reliable? Again, no. Yeah. And so I think, I was thought Hobbes doesn't discuss this. I think you can imagine people trying to do this at the end. Right? Like on the first day when everyone's supposed to start obeying the song. Like, you know, most people don't, and then the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> you know, so it's not like 100% reliable, but I think you can understand how this can get started by that. Like, the only question is, but I think this is a real, for Hobbes, this is, what I'm about to say is not like a, like a tricky objection or something, but it's a real serious problem. What about after they've been in the, in the civil state for a long time? Like for generations? Are they still afraid of going back to the state of nature? Do they remember what the state of nature was like? Are they able to reason the way Hobbes does to show what the state of nature would be like? Um, seems like maybe not. And so at that point, you know, maybe I start, if I'm one of these people joined much, who was born much later, I might start thinking to myself, you know, let me try to get some people together and have a rebellion. And I don't think that everyone else is necessarily going to oppose me because I don't think that they're going to think that the worst thing is to return to the state of nature. So that's why Hobbes keeps emphasizing over and over that one of the most important duties of a sovereign is education. In which, you know, including both education in a positive sense, but also like censorship. to make sure that generation after generation, people are taught the true political doctrine. Um, only if that happens will the Commonwealth survive. And he, he thinks that, that what happens to, the, to England is uh, a direct consequence of the sovereign not taking care of them. Um, okay. Okay, so what is the sovereign authorized to do? Um, well, um, if you remember the end of that passage I read, again, it's on page 109. 
um, everyone is to own and acknowledge himself to be author of whatsoever he that so beareth their person shall act or cause to be acted in those things which concern the common peace and safety. Um, so that, when you first look at it, sounds like it's a pretty serious limitation on the authorization that's been given to the sovereign. Right? Like, so if the sovereign shows up at my house and says, um, nice potatoes you have there, on your behalf, I'm giving them to me. <laughs> I can say, wait, I didn't authorize you to do that. That doesn't concern the common peace and safety. Um, and, uh, um, and Hobbes says that in general, authorized personation can be limited or conditioned, right? Like when I say, you know, I make my agent to go to the store and buy me potatoes. If you go somewhere else and buy me something else, then I can say, I want my money back. I didn't authorize you. I only authorize you to buy potatoes, right? So, um, so like this might seem like a promising basis for limited government, but um, in effect, this limit is either very small, or I guess maybe you should really say it's completely ineffective. And the reason is because one thing that certainly does concern the common peace and safety is deciding which things concern the common peace and safety and which things don't, <laughs> right? So if you come back to that case where the sovereign shows up at my door and says, you know, on your behalf, I'm giving myself your potatoes. And I say, that's not a matter that concerns the common peace and safety. And the sovereign says, that is a matter that concerns the common peace and safety. Now the sovereign is definitely speaking on my behalf. Do you understand what I'm saying now? So, um, right, so this is, uh, Hobbes discusses this at length. This is in chapter 18, paragraph 8 on page 113. And because the end of this institution is the peace and defense of them all, and whosoever has right to the end has right to the means, it belongeth of right to whatsoever man or assembly that hath his sovereignty to be judge both of the means of peace and defense, and also of the hindrances and disturbances of the same, and to do whatsoever he shall think necessary to be done, both beforehand for preserving the peace and security by prevention of discord at home and hostility from abroad, and when peace and security are lost, for the recovery of the same. So what is necessary for common peace and, society and uh, security is solely to be judged by the sovereign. Um, and I mean, uh, you can derive that both from the content of the covenant the way Hobbes stated it, right? Because as I said, that decision of whether something concerns the common peace and safety or not does concern the common peace and safety, but you can also derive it from the purpose of this covenant. Because if, and this is like something that Hobbes is going to use over and over against any kind of idea of limited, limited government. Suppose we say, no, the sovereign doesn't get to decide that. Who does get to decide that? Well, if we say um, the sovereign and I are going to have to fight it out, then we're back in the state of nature. Right? So, um, you know, but if we say someone else gets to decide, then that person is really the sovereign. Because that's the person who actually has the ability to decide what needs to be done for the purpose of peace and common safety. And that's the point of the covenant. 
So, um, so there can't be some other arrangement here. Um, right, and that's, you know, that's also why if you think, well, look, we're not gonna make the sovereign one assembly, we're gonna make the sovereign two assemblies and a single uh, individual, and the way it's going to work is that it's going to make decisions by majorities of both of these, and then this individual is going to have a veto, and we have a whole like a whole complicated system like that. Um, Hobbes is going to say, well, um, what happens when there's a dispute between this assembly and this assembly, or between this assembly and this individual about whether things were done right? For example, who's going to decide that? So either no one's going to decide that, and then Hobbes says that's what led to the English Civil War, King versus Parliament, um, or someone's going to decide that, and then that person is the real sovereign, whoever it is. Um, so, so despite the fact that the sovereign has been authorized only for limited purposes. The sovereign is basically um, has unlimited right to decide anything. I mean, that is, in any case, um, there's no artificial chains preventing that from doing anything. Um, or at least there's no artificial chains in the form of laws of common preventing them from doing anything. Um, the, the sovereign in, is like the sovereign as such is not a subject of the commonwealth. The subjects of the commonwealth are the, are the people who made these covenants with each other, but they didn't make a covenant with the sovereign. In fact, Hobbes says the sovereign is still in a state of nature. Not only with respect to other sovereigns, but with respect to the common, the sovereign is still in the state. Um, now, like of course, in a in a monarchy, it's pretty easy to understand what that means. There's this one human being who's not a subject, can't be prosecuted, can't be, you know, like all the things they did to Charles the First, you can't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, in the case where it's an aristocracy, or even more in the case where it's a democracy, this becomes rather abstract, right? Like each individual member of the assembly is a subject of the commonwealth, but the whole assembly can't be punished. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, um, so it's absolute government. Absolute monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy. Um, nevertheless, Hobbes lists in chapter 18 a whole bunch of specific things that we must have authorized the sovereign to do. And if you ask why he lists this, I mean, I think this has something to do with the general question about the intended audience for this book. Um, so, like, um, I mean, so it's partly because he's listing, among the things he's listing are a lot of the things that people had claimed in England, the king didn't have the right to do. Um, uh, so in that part, it's kind of, from that point of view, it's kind of like counter education, right? He's trying to explain to people why that was an absurd opinion that people had. That, you know, that let's say the king doesn't have the final right of, of uh, like um, deciding cases, that belongs to the House of Lords. Or, you know, the king doesn't have the right of levying taxes, that belongs to the House of Commons, right? So. Um, so that's one reason he's giving this list, but I think um, it's, I mean, but it's like, it's not for the purposes of the subject saying, hey, that's not on the list, you can't do that, because the subject can't complain, right, like the, the sovereign can say, 
Um, no, on your behalf, I declare that it is unlawful. <laughs> right? But it might be for the benefit of the sovereign. And in fact, like that sounds in that list like Hobbes is kind of talking to a, to a future sovereign, right? Because he's saying things like, you know, a, a sovereign who carelessly, like sovereigns should take, care, should take care about how they call up representatives from the people for their advice. So that is his analysis of what parliament was originally supposed to be is that the king, who's the sovereign, said, oh, I would like some advice from the people. Why don't you all choose representatives to come up here and advise me? Um, and um, um, of course, he didn't do that because the people didn't already have a representative. The sovereign is a representative. Right? The sovereign is authorized to represent the will of the people. It was just like, hey, I would like, why don't you send some people to come to me and talk? <laughs> you, you decide this, <laughs> right? That's what Parliament originally was. But then Hobbes says that because the kings were negligent and like didn't uh, make it clear to everyone that they're really the representative, and these are only advisors, and that they have all these powers and no one else can have them eventually an opinion grew up, an absurd opinion, that no, some of these powers don't really belong to the king, and that's what led to civil war. So Hobbes is saying to the sovereign, at least make sure you keep all these powers and make sure everyone understands why you have to keep all these powers. Um, he may also be saying to the sovereign, um, <laughs> People can't complain if you go out beyond these powers, but it wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> um, so there definitely are places where it seems to be saying things like that to sovereigns. So that, that's why I was so, I kept hedging it so much when I said that there are no artificial chains on the sovereign. There are no bad consequences. Well, yes and no. I mean, if the sovereign does really um, irrational things, then it will lead to civil war, which will be bad for them and everyone else. So there can be bad consequences, right? So, like, if you know, if the sovereign says, I think it's in the interest of common peace and safety for me to take everyone's potatoes and throw them in the river, and you guys won't have any potatoes anymore, haha. <laughs> then although they're perhaps authorized to do that, they can foresee. Although they're authorized to say they're authorized to do that, they, they can foresee that since that goes completely against the purpose for which the Commonwealth was established, the people are not really going to keep their word. And things will fall apart. So they are, so, so and you know, this is different from being the sovereign is in a state of nature, but it's different from the individual state of nature because it's a state of nature with this weird relationship with this huge body of people. Right? Like before, in the state of nature, if I started going around to everyone and taking their acorns, um, I could think, well, if they fight me, I'll fight back. And, you know, whatever. I can't be worse off than I am now. I don't have any acorns. Right, but in this state of nature here, the sovereign is like, on the one hand, I have just like everyone else, but more so the benefits of peace, right? Um, and uh, so I don't want to lose those. And on the other hand, if I like start egregiously acting in a foolish or irrational way. Um, whether they have the right to or not, this huge body of people is going to get very angry at me and gang up on me. <laughs> so they, so they, they really are working under a constraint. It's just not the same kind of constraint as everyone else. Um, um, So, I mean, I guess there's two other things I want to 
I'm not going to go through that list of powers in detail. I mean, it's interesting, although, again, I think some of them are there just because of the historical importance of them leading, leading up to the Civil War, uh, the English Civil War. Um, but, um, but there are two other things I want to talk about on this topic. So I guess one is, isn't this starting to sound like a really bad idea to give this one individual or assembly so much power? Um, so, you know, Hobbes' basic answer to that is, yes, there can be bad consequences of the sovereign having this much power. Why? Because, yes, they bear everyone's person, but they also bear their own person. <laughs> Everyone always bears their own person. And Hobbes says, and people usually care more about their own person. <laughs> person that they bear, right? So if the sovereign ever has a choice between their own private interests and the interests of the public, they're probably going to choose their own private interests. Um, and um, moreover, you know, especially in a monarchy, although actually he has all these arguments to show that an aristocracy or democracy is even worse. But anyway, let's say in a, in a monarchy, for example, the person who becomes the sovereign might be really irrational, might be uh, really stupid, might, you know, like, um, and then this could be a disaster. But he says, it sounds bad until you remember, remember what the alternative is. War of all against all. <laughs> Life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> and he says, nothing is worse than that. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> And you'll realize that this is always a good idea. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing I just wanted to discuss briefly is, does it seem now like there must be, some, must be something wrong with Hobbes' argument? Just based on our experience since Hobbes' time, right? Like, so, uh, you know, so we did have a civil war in this country, of course, you know, but it's been 150 years since then. Um, uh, and that's a really long time by historical stand standards, I think, to have peaceful transfer of power and stuff like that. that. I mean, of course, that's not saying that everyone's happy to be like this. <laughs> but again, it, are they happier than they would have been if those 150 years had been constant civil war? Like that's that's a lot less clear. Um, so, uh, but anyway, if if the if the claim is that any type of limitation or complicated mixed government or whatever is going to lead to civil war. The fact seems to be that uh, it doesn't lead the Civil War that quickly. <laughs> and remember, Hobbes doesn't claim that his commonwealth is going to last forever. Either. So, um, you know, like, I don't think the Roman Empire ever had 50 years without, <laughs> without uh, violent transfers of power, or civil war, or whatever. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what to say about that, partly because I'm not sure how to say what who Hobbes would say is really the sovereign in our system. It's not so clear who the sovereign really is. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, something that I've discussed with like friends, like, uh, and it's something that comes up, is just, like, you know, in, in America, there's like this, Interaction between the bureaucracy and the market where it's kind of ambiguous, but like uh, in an event like 9 11, you know, suddenly when there's like a direct threat, you know, or some perceived like foreign enemy, then like the president and like the surrounding cabinet like takes control over like the whole, you know, apparatus uh, and like you know, over transportation and whatnot. So it's like uh, who the sovereign, who the sovereign is, like, varies based on circumstances. 
Yeah, but it, but see, but according to Hobbes, that can't work. <laughs> there always has to be one person who's definitely the soft. You know, so um, uh, um, yeah, but I mean, also, like, it's not clear. Well, maybe we're out of time, but the, you know. Hobbes says what most leads to civil war is divided government. If there hadn't been a parliament and a king in England, there never would have been a civil war. Well, you know, that might be true, but I don't think that's the main cause of civil wars in March, even in England, right? The main cause of civil wars is wars of succession. Um, and Hobbes' system he spends a long time talking about succession for that very reason, but I think he has to admit that when it comes down to it, that's always going to be a really dangerous topic. Um, of course, we saw that in our system too. Succession can be a dangerous topic, but like I said, uh, 150 years is a good record, <laughs> even if it dissolves tomorrow. That's impressive. All right. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. I'll see you next week.